Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 409th new social environment. I'm Cal, curatorial assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Khan Trubkovich and Jason Rosenfeld. We are thrilled to have the poet Imogen Christian Smith here, who will read to, today, to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. We'd like to start by thanking the Dermot Company for supporting the new social environment this October, which marks the Rail's 21st anniversary. You can learn more about them and the Rail's curatorial projects at 66 Rockwell through the links in the chat. At the Rail, we open all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded lands and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom, in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, as said by the great Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Artist Khan Trubkovich uses rec recollection as the primary source material for his works on paper, paintings, and videos, drawing from subconscious references, deteriorated home footage, and recorded history. His work reflects moments warped both in both time and antiquated technology. Born in Moscow, Russia, Trubkovich lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Distinguished Chair and Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College, Jason Rosenfeld, PhD, has curated the exhibitions John Everett Millay at Tate Britain Van Gogh Museum, Pre-Raphaelites, the Victorian Avant-Garde, Tate Britain, and the National Gallery of Art BC, and River Crossings at Alana and Cedar Grove, Hudson and Catskill, New York. He's a senior writer, writer and editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Jason, take it away. Thank you so much, Cal. Uh, appreciate it. Great to be here again. Feels like it's been a, only a week, which it has. Um, thank you, Malvika, for all your help um, arranging as well, and Nick, and uh, a big thank you to James at uh, Gagosian Gallery, who have been great partners on this event today, and Khan, who is with us, uh, coming to you live from Gowanus, and I'm coming to you live from the West Village, just a few waterways apart. So Khan, say hello, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Awesome to have you here today. Um, let me start with the images. We'll just get right into it because we have a lot of cool stuff to look at and talk about. There you have the uh, Instagram address. You should follow uh, the artist, as you should all of these artists. It's a great place to see what's going on and uh, their mindset, and what they're thinking, what they're working on. Um, and you must go to 75th and Park, where you will be greeted by the ever-smiling Horace uh, security guard you see there outside. Um, and this is Gagosian's uh, location there on Park Avenue, the shop front, uh, where you can see uh, Khan's exhibition right now, the anti-penultimate end, which ends, sadly, on October 23rd. So that's this Saturday. So hopefully people can get up there uh, to see it, and you might even run into James while you're up there. Say hello to her. And uh, it's a terrific show um, with a modest number of large scale paintings, which allows us to get into it in uh, real depth. But I thought that initially, at least, we would talk a little bit about Khan and his uh, background, earlier art, um, interesting history, personal history. This is a view of him in his studio with some of the works that you uh, we'll be looking at we'll be looking at closely today and um, fairly neat looking arrangement of paints I think I would say I've seen a lot of artist studios they're often not nearly this neat um, but uh, uh, this uh, idea of engaging with these pictures which are large scale the paintings which are in the show and I'm just gonna run through it real quick and then we'll sort of start talking um, there's a golden ratio orange which you see there on the left, um, on the north wall of the exhibit, then the anti-penultimate end from 2019, the eponymous picture for the exhibition and the title of which we will try to deconstruct for you. Um, and then the back wall here uh, is golden ratio chartreuse, everyone's pseudo green color, favorite pseudo green color there from 2021. And on the right is this image female figure after Popova, uh, from 2021. Khan's going to correct my Russian all day, so I, it's going to no, be no, fine, was, my pronunciation. That was, that was okay? Yeah. 
My parents tell me some of our people came from Russia back in the day. So maybe it's, it's uh, trickled down a little bit. And there you see these same two works. And then the final work here on the right, which is called Barricade from 2021, which is a really awesome uh, looking thing. Uh, I think you can see already that there's some interesting distortions going on in these large scale pictures. These are all, by the way, oil paintings, just to understand the medium, because we will be looking at different medium uh, media today. Uh, when we're talking about it. But um, Khan uh, was born in 1979 and moved here in 1990. So maybe give us just a little bit of a potted background for our uh, listeners today of your, your history. Until um, you get to this, what we're looking at now, these images. I was born in 1979, as you said, in Moscow. Um, I grew up um, family, kind of uh, of creatives my on my father's side there were my grandfather was a children's book illustrator um and um i was exposed to quite a lot of art um uh, stuff and mainly also art making a lot of materials around me growing up a lot of studio practice happening with my grandfather making books and drawings all day and you know so that was really that was kind of uh, my first introduction to art um I moved to the United States when I was 11 years old with my family, with my mother and my stepfather. And we moved first to Philadelphia, then to New York. Um, and um, I went to art high school in New York City called LaGuardia. And that's when I started to be, began to study art. And, you know, I've just always, I've always been, um, interested in making art and interested in uh, the practice of the, the studio practice and, and um, a kind of overall um, interest in the world of artists and the world of um, art making. When you moved to the US, that was in 1990? 1990, yeah. 1990, and what, how long were you in Philadelphia? About two and a half years. Okay. so but. What did it have a, a deep effect, do you think? I mean, as your first experience. Yeah. I'm from near Philadelphia, by the way. Um, Bucks County, just north, 29 miles north. No, you know, I moved to. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, because I was, I didn't really um, leave the Northeast Philly very, you know, like it was, we would move to kind of like an immigrant enclave. Okay. And then as soon as we could, we moved out. And so. Okay. And so I did, I did attend for one year uh, creative and performing arts in Philadelphia, the high school for my freshman year. And so mm -hmm. I did get to see, and so I, at that point I did get to see the museum and all the uh, yeah. things in Center City. But for the, my first few years, we were living in a basically kind of a, um, a, 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 an immigrant neighborhood in, in right. on the, an exurb on the outside of North Philly. And how, and how good was your English, would you say, when you got here? I, I didn't speak at all. No. Nothing. Nothing. It's amazing. Yeah. There's such a long tradition of yeah. Russians who pick up English and then are far better than Americans at speaking English from Nabokov <laughs> to yeah. you to Madve Levenstein. I mean, you it's an amazing all, thing. You just named the only three. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, no it's, it's remarkable. I have to say it's remarkable. Maybe there's just some kind of connection there. So you picked no, that up right away and then entered as a freshman in high school. Um, I, I entered as a freshman in high school in, in Philadelphia, then I transferred yeah. to New York to LaGuardia as a sophomore. Yeah. I preface, I, well, I'll say that also uh, I'm self-taught past high school. I didn't really go to university um, and, and I basically consider myself an autodidact. So mm -hmm. that, I don't know how important it is, but th that is kind of part of my history is that I just, um, I didn't do any of the kind of MFA programs or even undergrad, right. but I just- um, But you could have, you could have gone to LaGuardia and come out in musical theater. I almost did. <laughs> is that right? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've done some film work, but um, yeah, yeah. So you were working in the, in the arts program there. Um, yeah. was, was that in the old high school or the newer? This is the new one, the, the new one by the Lincoln Center, yeah. On the Upper West Side. So where yeah. were you living in New York City? So I grew up in Washington Heights. Um, I moved out of, so after high, all through high school, I commuted from Washington Heights and I lived there with my dad and my brother. And I um, 
after high school, I moved out, moved downtown. And that's kind of where I met a lot of the people that introduced me to contemporary art. And, um, you know, because I didn't go to even bachelor's or undergrad, not to say grad school even, I, um, I ended up at some point needing to self-educate kind of. And, and through, I did that through meeting friends and kind of picking up their books and picking up random knowledge of, from the, their studies. And, um, and I, I don't think I would have been able to do that had I not ended up downtown with a group of people that were, you know, pretty interesting. And, you know, from artists to just regular, you know, people studying philosophy or studying literature, or whatever, there's just people involved in, in intellectual pursuits. And I was kind of piggybacking off of their studies in those early days. Right. Huh. And yeah, it's such a rarity, honestly, for me. I'm interviewing every every artist I've interviewed has always went to Yale yeah. or you know, the yeah. usual schools. So you just yeah. didn't do that. So how do you get from uh, LaGuardia to these works and then where these works sort of led to you? Talk so, to us a little bit about the PS1 show. Yeah, this is a good place to start. This is my first show. I um I got quite serious about reading, you know, trying to understand. A, a kind of contemporary discourse and art in my, I would say around 23 years old. And um, I spent a, a couple of years really just kind of buried in books and mm -hmm. painting, but mainly, but that wasn't actually the focus of those, or like those two years. And then at some point, I think I realized that I was ready to start making things. and. That summer in 2000, I believe it was 2003, I went on a road trip, to, uh, a cross country road trip. And um, it was just me and my friend, we, we, you know, we camped out, we drove from LA to New York and we kind of took the Northern route through Wyoming and Montana, Idaho, Utah, all these like kind of states that were quite empty and beautiful and, you know, that kind of strange Mars looking part of America. And um, I filmed a lot of stuff. And in fact, what these drawings on the screen are now are were filmed at Little Bighorn in Wyoming. Or is that Montana? It's Montana. It's right on the border, Montana or Wyoming. Mm. And, um, and when I came back, I started, re I was rewatching the video. I guess this is like the creation myth of how this work began. Like I, I was rewatching the video from our trip and I remember pausing it on one of these images. And suddenly the, pa the, the, the pause kind of reminded me of a painting gesture okay? where like, you know, you can sometimes when you, even like Franz Klein was talking about like when you would make a big broad gestures, they would think about dancers or something like that. They thought about jazz dancing. And so to me, these um, pauses reminded me in the same kind of way of the abex gestures, where I thought, oh, the, I'm using a kind of mediated um, tool to make a gesture that then can be sort of create a visual narrative. Um, but was it what kind of equipment were you using? I, I just had a like um, a, a high eight camera, and on the high eight camera, you'd plug it right into the TV, and it had the yeah the forward like um. Uh, still forward, like you can go one still at one yeah. still at a time, and it was really beautiful. This camera was, you know, as with most of the equipment I use, was like basically on its last days, and and it had um, this amazing quality patina to the to to on screen. It just immediately looked like something else, even on screen before you even made it into a drawing. And so yeah. I I thought this would be interesting to make into drawings. And the first thing I did was actually um these tiny little six by six inch watercolors and this is it, it comes you know for years i was trying to make like big paintings and i was you know kind of painting student work that was you know not in school but again it was still student work because i was mm. still considered myself a student uh, they were really kind of like big expressionistic paintings and um and then all of a sudden I was, I moved my practice into just a corner of my apartment and making these tiny little watercolors. And I think that that was extremely liberating. 
And there was a kind of, the, the, this, the method began to develop of how to make these things. So these were the first works I made. I, at the time, and I wasn't finished with them, but I had a, a several in my studio. I met a, 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 well, I had this friend named Alana Gabin, uh, and she was pretty connected to a, a kind of downtown group of people. And one of those people was Neville Wakefield. Um, who I, I believe she would babysit his two sons. And, um, and she showed him some of the drawings and he really liked them. And uh, that's how the show, he was curating uh, at PS1 at the time. And so that's how the show mm -hmm. at PS1 happened. And so I was 25 years old. I mean, really, I didn't, as much as I thought I was kind of like trying to catch up and read up on art and like really understand um, myself in the contemporary context, like, mm -hmm. I really didn't understand what it meant to be in the art world or to have shows or to have represent, representation or have any sort of, um, you know, the, a lot of, I think that's what they teach you in grad school these days, you know? Yeah, it's somewhat. <laughs> so <laughs> the, Im the imagery here is, is very uh, meaningful and, and kind of loaded. I mean, I wonder how much that factored into your thinking. I wanna, don't wanna spend too much time in the early work, but we haven't talked about this before, oh. so it's really interesting. This is Little Bighorn, Montana, the idea of the, the last gasp effort of the Native Americans to push this, back militarily against the impending uh, governmental Custer, destruction Custer, of their race. This is yeah, Custer's, Custer's last, last stand, stand, but it's, yeah, it's right. really the the yeah. Lakotas and the Cheyennes' last stand. You know, or, or their last the, victory. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I um I think that I think for me, there's a kind of elaborate self-portrait that's just constantly happening with my work. And this is the, okay. there's a kind of undercurrent that's always referring to something that I'm feeling in relation to my position in this country. Or, uh, you know, it, even with the current work, it's always, there's always that element. And so I think this was this, in this earliest work, there is a um, trying to understand myself as an American and, you know, and encountering a kind of a very violent interior. Mm. And, and, and because, you know, we always, um, as when I was growing up, there was a kind of like myth of American violence as a kind of urban thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you reach the interior of the country, which is so vast and strange and beautiful, and then you happen upon these places that are just like, you know, soaked in violence um and 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 so i thought this was something that i just was trying to find my place in it and i was you know we were driving around you know the the american sort of pastoral west like listening to johnny cash albums and like murder ballads and happen up on this place and so i think that that was um a kind of you know this youthful way of trying to understand this place do you think it had any connection also with your background or the history of, of your country, Russia, and, uh, you know, in not any in, kind of sense? Not in any conscious way. I think this was really me, like, trying to figure out my American kind of version of myself. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at some more early works, like this set. Um, it's just called Flight. It's a set of three uh, watercolor on paper uh, works. Um from 2006, so a little bit later, you can see still working with this idea of, of the screen. And I remember, you know, when we used to have VHS, it was a big new thing, video, and uh, the way that, that you would get that strange transition from different images overlap, which you don't really get with film at all. Mm -hmm. In VHS, you would get these ghostly images and this sort these, both those early sets sort of remind me of that, but this is a convict on the, on the lamb. So this is, um, again, we have to remember this is 06, right? So this is all in the context of Abu Ghraib, the Iraq war madness that was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so this character in an orange jumpsuit began to appear in my work around the same time. I was also reading this, at the time, big, uh, uh, this guy named Eric Fromm, this German, uh, um, Frankfurt School guy had a big effect on me. I read this book called Escape from Freedom, which mm -hmm. was um, which became the basis for quite a bit of work uh, that had this idea of this kind of itinerant convict in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was in a sense kind of an alter ego, but uh, but the 
the video itself was me and a friend in a forest with a steady cam just running around in a figure eight. And so there was a, a, um, a way to emulate a, a kind of in being locked in a kind of inescapable kind of cycle of work and uh, reward, work and reward, work and reward kind of thing um and, again and you're shooting you're shooting this footage so this is yeah, this, this is people this should know this is different from what you've been doing more recently which is drafting from other sources but here you're actually creating the footage well i've always done all three i've always kind of picked for the public domain picked mm -hmm. my own, shot my own footage and used home footage those are always three things that are like um three sort of streams that are always kind of in my work. Huh, okay. Let's see what the next set here. Untitled works. Are these, are you the model in these? Uh, yeah, this is me. And they were made in 07, but I shot this in like 04. Again, okay. like, uh, the, like uh, going in, in a sense that this was my kind of self-schooling of looking at Bruce Nauman, discovering Bruce Nauman and being like, oh, yeah. There's there's a whole stream of art that is possible with a camera that you know that was something I had to discover. It wasn't like obvious to me. Mm -hmm. What is the medium of these? Con? These are watercolors, and these are the six by sixes I was talking about. These are tiny. Yeah, small works. Yeah, small works. So it's really interesting. You know, yeah, a facility with the filming itself and the medium of the film. And then with the material, whether it's the graphite, which we saw in the Little Bighorn mm -hmm. uh, works, or or watercolor here, um, and now moved in, moving into oil paint. But we'll see other material. Do you feel most comfortable in any particular medium? No, but I think I I don't I like the idea of uh, the, when I when I it's when I feel uncomfortable when I find myself comfortable. It's like I don't know how this makes sense. It's a, obviously it's a kind of uh, paradoxical, but. I start to feel panicked and uncomfortable with the medium when it becomes kind of, when I become complacent with it. With it. So mm -hmm. as long as there's something happening that feels risky and, un, and, and undiscovered yet, that's that yeah. feels kind of more uh, where I feel like I'm in the right place. As soon as, and we'll get to this kind of sentiment later down the road when we talk yeah. about different kind of work I was making a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. But- um, Yeah, I think, go ahead, sorry. Um, just wanted to say again, like at this time, like early on, like seeing the video pause was a way for me to make something as expressionistic and as like potent as I, as I, I wanted my art to be without kind of feeling like I had to wave a magic wand paintbrush, like in, mm -hmm. where I could go into the studio every day and do something that was productive and, and, and moving the work forward without feeling like I had to be inspired. That was what I was thinking that. It's not yeah. necessarily how I feel now. I feel like those two streams have kind of collided and I'm able to wield it a little better. But at the time I felt like, well, I don't want to be, um, just have to go in and like make something good every day. I can just work. And so this part of the part of this, and then of course that, that orange clad kind of guy was a, um, a metaphor for that. Yeah, yeah. Good. So now in works like these um, from 2012, these are oil paintings, uh, you seem to be mining a different kind of resource, not works that you're shooting or self-imaging, but rather these are, these are uh, films of your mother right after you yes. left Russia. No, actually, right, when you made right the decision before. to leave Russia, this right is, before um, this is, and this is like in my family lore, kind of a famous evening. We had this. My parents had this like massive blowout party before we immigrated. It was like a few days before we everything was packed up and we left. So mm -hmm. everybody came from all over the place, and there's a video, and I remember this quite well. This party it was really fun people you know it was like a big catharsis and i and i always watch this uh video like nostalgically to see some of the old mom parents friends or my friends and see myself in the video and there's this moment in the video where kind of 
my someone taps my mom on the shoulder and she looks up and she's just like young and kind of all the nightmare kind of madness of immigration hadn't really happened yet you know and so there's this pretty wonderful hopeful bushy-tailed kind of thing in her face and I remember pausing it again and being like wow this is this and it looked like of course once you start pausing it it starts gaining this strange baroque quality to it right the yeah. the, the, the kind of chair square quality of just coming out of the darkness and um and so I thought, okay, I want to, I really would like to make this into a painting. And I started making it into a painting. It didn't, the first version of it really didn't work. And it wasn't until I figured out that I wanted to actually paint all the, the little lights, all the little pixels separately was the one that these paintings. So these are the first paintings where I did that with my mom's image, where the, where the techniques start to develop on layering and, and, and having broad areas of color. And then these, these kind of pixelated marks on top that build that image up. So who was shooting this film though? Uh, you were you were young, you were 11. It was, so. it, it was like a, a, a drunken, crazy party. Everybody was just passing this camera around. So there's this- Imagine like a tape. massive camera. Yeah, it's no, yeah, it's, like a, it's like a tape uh, that yeah. everyone, you, people would pick up the camera, start right. filming, someone's falling over, somebody's kissing in the corner. You know, it was like a, the, so it, it, my mom is gotta be like 33 in this video. And so when I was making yeah. this painting, I was around that age. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, don't, kind of I guess we have, a, we have a perception of whatever Russia was like in Perestroika. And yeah. the idea of, you know, what kind of material you could get and the idea of getting a camera that you would have a tape that you could then somehow play when you got to the US seems crazy somehow, but maybe I, I totally am undercutting uh, the accessibility to technology in, in Moscow. <laughs> well, what happened was, I think it, it's funny you bring this up because I remember clearly this had to have been like 88, seeing mm -hmm. a VCR for the first time, seeing a movie being fast forwarded for the first time yeah and it completely blowing my mind <laughs> like yeah. uh, like, a, like the most strangest thing you've ever seen um but within a few years it was a little bit easier right you think by the time that by 1990 you had just a kind of black market you could pretty much get anything you know okay. you, could, you could afford it so so you know they did have a we did have a vcr and i and and by that by this time but um of course there's the two i think we've talked about this before there's the two formats there was policy account and there was ntsc yeah <clears throat> excuse me and um well i had to transfer this video from paul because i couldn't watch it right anyway. <laughs> wait how funny all right so these uh, i do they do seem very wistful very beautiful very sort of frozen in a moment in time um, and you know something that a lot of filmmakers were working with in this period, which we'll we'll get to. But I brought up a couple works by Adam Agoyan. I don't know if people out there know him. Um, his star has dimmed a little bit, only because he's been doing films that are uh, that are very focused and less for a, a larger audience. He's a Toronto filmmaker, Armenian descent, um, and his early works in the '80s and the '90s uh, were all about. Uh, sort of combination of family, the political, uh, government, uh, tapes factor in almost every of these films, VHS tapes, blurred images, frozen images. Um, he has his wife uh, in lot, most of these films. She's the star of most of these films. And um, my favorite is uh, uh, Exotica. It's a terrific movie about lots of different issues. Bruce Greenwood did a lot of films with him. Anyway, um, your work really made me think of this because Egoyan is constantly plumbing his own personal history in making these kinds of films. So I recommend anybody out there uh, have a look um, at these and the v VHS is, is a critical or even beta tapes he's using. I, I really like the idea of having the kind of overlap of personal and collective um... To tell to tell a kind of story in film or in painting to have a kind of connective tissue experience where the thing is very personal and at the same time has a kind of collective voice. Yeah, uh, I'm always thinking about that as a as that the thing is not you know 
not to have a work of art just as a kind of form of navel gazing kind of internal thing, internal uh, uh, quest, but like also to have a, a broader sort of understanding of how it fits into a collective um, human experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a way, you know, Gerhard Richter does a similar kind of thing in, in his art. He's not I just saw someone wrote Jungian. Sorry, I'm not supposed to pay attention to it. Yeah, that's true. Jungian. <laughs> yes, well, Mr. Schwartz will bring up these kinds of things, which are always on point. Um, but, uh, you know, the way that Richter mines personal photographs um, and his own history in, in making his work, not dealing with film. There's something about film, though, which has a kind of poignancy. I don't know. I get. I mean, photographs are instantly nostalgic. Mm -hmm. You know, almost once you take them, I realized this a lot once I became a dad, which is 19 years ago now, but, you know, everything, you're sort of nostalgic for the moment, even when you're in it. Um, but video, video has that, that feeling in a, in a really, in a really vivid sense. Well, it's also, I think, has like, now this feeling of history, like a bronze or something, you know what I mean? Like, because yeah. it's related. So there is an antiquity kind of recent antiquity, but it's still a kind of different age feeling to it then yeah um, and and of course analog video which is what i work with isn't is so particular because it has a shelf life it has a um it has degradation it doesn't it really doesn't remain the same right. over time the machines everything is kind of stuck in this uh cycle of entropy so th there's no um there's no continuity to it and I mean I think that the the painting which is what I like about it, it's similar to painting where you don't you could never make the same mark twice and everything yeah. you know has its own um logic that inherent in the medium that it will, outside of the artist's hand yeah it's extraordinary the degradation I mean I see that I'm a sports fan you know if you watch NBA highlights from oh. the 1980s that are on from video they're horrific but yeah. films from the 60s, 50s look terrific because yeah. they're shot in a different meaning. We're not going to have good footage of the 1980s, you know, soon because it's all just degrading unless someone yeah. preserves yeah. it all. Um, so moving into the more contemporary, more recent work, um, here's the exhibition to maybe talk a little bit about this series well, uh, from the show House of the Rising Sun 2015. Let's just show this to give a sense of scale. It's not work. so, um, they're not, they're kind of concurrent. I, I envision these Reagan paintings as part, so the, the, the mom portraits and the Reagan portraits, yep. I saw them as a kind of two polarities, but, a, but the same body of work. Mm -hmm. um, I was sort of thinking about them at the time as, the, as, this, as, a, as the male and female ego of myself maybe but more maybe broad a broader kind of societal thing where you know you have this internal kind of hopefulness of the female ego and the kind of the um individualistic selfish kind of male ego and um and these are generalizations or just how i kind of categorize them in my mind but so I thought what if these so the, the Reagan image is taken from the Brandenburg Gate speech you know the uh, mm -hmm. tear down the wall Mr. Gorbachev yeah. and um I imagined in a kind of meta narrative that the mom glancing up and the Reagan on Brandenburg Gates were were happened at the same second I mean of course this yeah. is a fantasy but I thought this would be a, an interesting framework for these paintings and I thought I, I'm going to paint one second of time and then in this it's two seconds but they happen simultaneously so it's really one second and there'll be um 24 paintings of each like uh the, the frames in the in the film and I will I'll use that number and I'll make 48 of these paintings mm -hmm. and um and so this this became this body of work these two polarities the Reagan paintings and the mom paintings but they really to me are um the the same body of work now, they're was it formatted the same you know they're they're, they're they're cropped the same way they're made the same way they, yeah was it was it i i could understand one thing painting your vibrant mother when she was in her early 30s but what was it like painting 24 images of reagan you know 
to <laughs> it's weirdly like the, the context recedes i mean it becomes really about um surface and the, yeah the little tensions on the surface that happen that's what you get lost in the image thinking about where these paintings end up and what they are that right you know, there's like 48 paintings, paintings right they can be and so it's important for me to make to contextualize how i think about them because mm. you know it's they're not in they're, they're not in any way kind of advancing any kind of politics yeah. one way or the other they're really about a sort of the internal pull of both of these directions yeah uh, you know yeah and then there's also the some that you did uh, these are prints these are no these i made these by ah. rubbing, rubbing pastel pigment into paper and then erasing into it so they're uh erase drawings essentially erase drawings Draw, like drawing uh, erasers like what robert longo does so you're yeah. working from the yeah, dark yeah. to the light very similar but with color i was like i could do that but i'm i, I so i worked with this uh guy named robert doak to mm -hmm. come up with uh and those that know about robert doak will know it's not an easy thing to do to work with bob um okay. He, he, uh, we, we, I basically came to him and I said, I want to do have a, a medium that is charcoal essentially, but with color pigment. I want that same because with color pigment, you know, all the different pigments have different properties. So some are erasable and some are, you know, like sticky and, you know, and there's just smudge. all the, all the different, they smudge impossible. So we figured out a way with, uh, with granulated glass powder and a bunch of other additives that we tested out of figured out how to actually make color charcoal huh. oh, but it's not charcoal i'm just using it to, yeah yeah it's, it's not actually in, in a similar way in a similar yeah, yeah, way. But they're pigments they're just uh, huh. straight pigment. that's interesting that you're racing to form yeah to to produce the form mm -hmm. in 1 25th of a second or 1 24th of a second so uh, film, this one, uh, Snow, was from 2014, and then we'll go into the present show. Actually, actually, two more images of the present show. Uh, Snow, an example of some of your film that you've been pursuing, um, you know, over the course so of your career. A combination of several things. Um, mm -hmm. The beginning of this film was a trove of video cassettes that I've uh, I, so preface this, we have a, have a family friend named Ksenia, who is an old, old family friend of my mother's who I grew up with. And she, as long as I know, because she she likes to drink a bit more than your average bear, um, she uh, always filmed everything. I mean, she always had a video camera because I think she just was didn't want to forget what was going on. And so she, um, always filmed and so i remembered that she had this like box of video cassettes of my whole childhood like from <laughs> even from moscow until current and so at some point i i, I asked her because they were all over the place i said listen i'll digitize all of this for you and create an archive for you as long as i can keep the cassettes and she said no problem so that was the deal we made and and so i came into possession of all of the video cassettes that she filmed over the years and I began to edit them into this bizarre little short film about this. It was basically two locations, this, this, this nighttime drive through snowy Moscow and this trip to Disneyland. And it kind of goes back and forth between these two strange kind of archetypal um, locations for Russia yeah. and, and Polar polarities. polarities. What, what is the John Cage connection? This, the, it was there's no John Cage connection, is there? Oh, yeah, because four minutes and thirty three seconds is the is the length of his Completely, famous. Composition. I know, I know exactly. I have never even ah the, the first thing I thought of. Okay, good. <laughs> well, it's better that way. It's better well, yeah. That way. Well, no, and the, actually, there was a uh, this was premeditated. Jason, you're right. <laughs> Ah. No. Um, no, I know that's an that's a that's an interesting uh, coincidence. No, I did. There was no the ah. the snow the the snow comes out of again a, a play on words because it's uh, yeah the snow of the of the video 
a grain and then the snow of uh, the static and the snow in the yeah. street. And then so I, I took this video, edited it down, then I transferred it all onto 35 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. So then I got this big reel of film and, and then I painted on the film. Yeah. So there's the, all of these, this was an experiment to see how many things I can layer on to each other, basically. Yeah, I, love, I wanna see the whole thing, it'd be, be great. But uh, snow is really interesting in the history of art. John Constable, the great romantic painter mm -hmm. from England who was the contemporary of Turner, but much less successful. Mm -hmm. He was always, he was accused of uh, using what they called Constable Snow, which mm -hmm. was basically white little touches of highlights in his landscapes to mm -hmm. kind of make them glisten. And uh, he called it the chiaroscuro of nature. But um, critics in the, at the time in the early 1800s saw it as interference. They read it as literally as interference mm -hmm. that was between them and engaging with the landscape image. So I think there's a, a nice continuity there. One last slide. These are two works that, uh, that, uh, that you, we were talking about there from a sort of transitional use of color. There's a Picasso and Munch and uh, expressionism and even cats. I'm a cat person, many people out there know. A um, little self-portraiture, I think, uh, struggle, all this kind of thing. But these really interesting works, just to give people a, a, a sense of sort of the broadness of, of Khan's, uh, Khan's sort of range of experimentation, both with media and also in terms of imagery. So, you know, I've, I've always had this, um, this theme in my, in my career where I'm like, whatever is happening to me kind of is always happening publicly. I don't know how to not show what I'm doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and so this was the mom and the Reagan images in some ways became so resolved that I felt like I had come to a kind of dead end with that, with the, specifically with the video. I didn't know how to reinvent the kind of, or, or find the, in, the inventive impulse anymore because I just kind of knew how to make them. And so I knew that because the work, it, it, technically the work is really demanding. You have to, you know, you're painting the screen pixel by pixel. And so there's not a lot of room to kind of move things around in the, on the canvas. And I felt like I needed to do that in, in order to get to the next station. Um, so, I so I put aside painting the, the detailed pixelated parts of the paintings for a while and I just, and if you see in the painting on the left, the final rehearsal, there's still the video image underneath. And in fact, right. the, the play, the mobile also, it's all painted out, but also had a, a video image underneath the video still. Mm -hmm. But they were then handled very loosely. And I, you know, you see the Grizzle underpainting print there. That's, this is how they would, they look when I start all the paintings I make. Yeah, sure. um, but so the, the, I needed to, be able to ha take risks right on the surface and expand my understanding of how color worked and how I could move forward in a from a place that felt very constricted at that point. And so, what they, these were these paintings, and you know, in in a way, they were like successful failures. You know, this is how mm. you know, and each one. I mean, I had two or three shows of works like this before I really finally got back into having it all work together. And um, and this is was a really long, for me, what felt like difficult, painful process, which then I think, had I not gone through it, I would not have been able to make the paintings that are up in uptown now, these ones, yeah. Right, I think, I think it's, you can see that the color then has come out in a really charged way, um, even if just details, which you can see in these, pictures and then the, this one and the one in the back. So yeah, let's talk uh, about the new show um, and about some of these works now that we have a kind of a, a kind of a background and the idea of the anti-penultimate -pen, anti end, penultimate just, second to last. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, just not to cut you off, but just if you go to that next slide, um, you can, I see now the fruits of all of that um like yes see all, you can see the the struggle in those paintings to get to this point and that that's feels yeah. like, uh, um now it makes a lot of sense like as kind of uh looking back is a sort of you know uh 
a 2020 kind of like vision to see, oh, that right. makes sense. But at the time, this to get to a point where I could like paint a field of color and then paint the um, the, the video image and have that thing work seemed in, impossible somehow. And so the, yeah, the, well, it took a strange detour to get here. Yeah, that it feels like those works which you kind of see, seem like you consider them a little experimental. Yeah. We're able to get you to this point where you can have uh, like in this one, golden ratio chartreuse, this broad area of chartreuse at the bottom. Yeah. And then these figures who are pixelated, the bands and, you know, more of a sense of a background beyond it's and, and work with it seamlessly in a way where it really makes sense. Um, and also in a big scale in a large scale, not just in terms of the, the canvases, because you have worked on that scale before, but in terms of the ambitions of the composition. Right. So here is uh, this work, which is in the present show and a detail of it here. And uh, just talk to us a little bit about this idea of the golden ratio, the golden can, ratio, can different from the golden rule, but the golden ratio, yeah. Someone remind me of the Don Brown book, the name of the book. Don Brown or Dan Brown? Dan Brown, I mean, they made it into the movie. Yes. I, I, what was it called? The Da Vinci Code? Da Vinci Code, there you go, thank you. Yeah. This it, is what- He uses is too many italics. But this is I can't read it, too many italics. This is what I liked about these images. So the, the, the uh, images of the Ukrainian um, parliament uh, mm. fight, which what this is what these were. They started showing up on the internet as this kind of, yeah, so there you go. This, this hilarious kind of meme called a, um, accidental renaissance. And so this was, and this was the first paintings, and then all of a sudden, these other, all these other people started posting paintings that, uh, photos that looked like Baroque paintings. And um, I, you know, I find them really interesting, and I also thought it was really funny that they were, you know, that this was all going back to some like Don Dan Brown Da Vinci Code uh, yeah. with the Fibonacci curve, and you know, this is all really corny stuff if you like, like. Um, um italian renaissance and like you know it, 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 there's a lot of like jokiness involved in this that if and it kind of feels insidery but i let's explain let's explain the source image a little bit because you mentioned it for a second but for people yeah. who are not familiar with this crazy scene the source um, image is a fight between russian separatists and ukrainian nationalists in the ukrainian parliament in 2015 it is basically the the after effects ongoing after effects of the fall of the soviet union and the kind of balkanization of all these different uh areas that have fallen apart from the sphere or, or within the sphere or in the struggle to to um ascertain their sphere from Putin, Putin's Russia, and, mm -hmm. and 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 so this is um, you know there's a war there's a war happening as we speak there in Western yep. Ukraine, and um, this was a pretty serious thing. Except for that, you know, the in a way it became also a caricature, right, of this kind of Eastern European madness. Um, but to me, of course, it was also. Um, quite personal because they the people really look like people you know you know and, and and also the um when i was looking at this uh at this painting i had this sudden sensation that i'd seen it or this photograph of the parliament that i'd seen it before somehow that there was something particularly familiar with it and so yeah this next slide it reminded me of a painting that i saw when i was very little that i think was a very foundational work of art for me as a child, which is the blinding of Samson, Rembrandt's blinding of Samson. And I remember as a kid seeing this work in a book and reproduction and, and just being mesmerized by it and just thinking, man, this is a, felt like illicit and almost um, um, forbidden kind of thing that I shouldn't be able to see this and then to think that this is art and, I like art and it just kind of opened up this whole way of thinking about painting for me as a child that I think stuck with me. And, I, and I've always been attracted to these kinds of grand history works. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when I saw 
the the images of the fight, I think I immediately wanted to make them into that scale of a painting. Like I, that's where the idea came from of 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 the the connection to this childhood experience uh, mm -hmm. of discovery and of discovering Rembrandt and just being you know kind of mesmerized by this work. And um, and so the impulse was to kind of make it on that scale and make those paintings on that scale. And then of course, all the, the, the title refers back to the silliness, of course, of, of the, the kind of strange Don Brown conspiratorial yeah. like thing, you know, about art. And the idea that there's a, a perfect layout for a picture right. that right. somehow puts you into the exact state of mind. So the golden That's ratio, right. yeah, the golden also section. Very funny that there is a kind of formula that, that, that you would make the perfect composition with. Yeah, but artists have always claimed to follow it and you're not doing it, but that here, you know, you're not making that claim, but artists have always claimed that they've used it or they followed it. And I don't know, it's, it's almost impossible to teach claim, or help well, people to understand. <laughs> all sort of things. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I always love this Rembrandt painting. I always show it in class because it's an early work and I'm a big fan of any images of Hebrew heroes um, yeah. being Jewish myself, and we're not allowed to show them in synagogues. So here they were in, in yeah. these artworks, but also he's this amazing spinning sort of almost swastika shaped form yeah. of his body, yeah. Samson, as he's having a knife plunged in it to his eye. Delilah's sneaking out the back. It always looked well, also he's, mysterious and you know, he's to me. He's got his hair and the he's hair, got his hair is, yeah. is the source of his power. So the fact that she's cut yeah. his hair with the scissors is what is, allows these other guys to 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 uh, yeah. overtake him. It's it such a great painting. And I always thought, I always felt like it was in a cave. I know yeah. it's in a tent, it, but it oh, feels like, like it's in a cave. It looks like a cave, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So uh, there's another work in the show that similarly shows uh, this crazy fight breaking out in um, in the parliament, this one, golden ratio, orange. I mean, this is like, you know, this is, it feels like our government is close to that here in this country, except the fighting has happened outside and then inside the Capitol, but not amongst the politicians. But it feels like we're getting closer and closer to that in this point, we, at this point in our nation's history, but this mad scene of chaos, extraordinary. Well, you know, this is like the kind of, when it gets serious, <laughs> when it got serious actually it's um i started these paintings in maybe six months before or like conceiving of the images thinking about making the images like six or five months before covid started and then i began to paint them during the lockdowns mm -hmm. and um and so i was working on these images again like for all the the, the reasons i just stated because of the rembrandt painting i thought I, yeah, I had a connection to it because um, I just thought that the image itself was fascinating. You know, it was, I was the ideas were starting to coalesce, but it was when the riots began and when the uh, like the September uh, January sixth happened and when the the politics went completely nuts in this country. Just that mm -hmm. year of, of 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 tragedy and and madness and and, and like and treachery and you know all sorts of things that, that we all experience yeah. and then seeing these paintings and of course these things are happening whether this image in ukrainian parliament or the other images in uh moscow after the putsch this kind of chaos in a in a, in a um in a civil society um and i couldn't distinguish the difference between this and, and and what was happening in the United States. And I think that was a really scary and intense, and it kind of gave me, it was a scary experience for myself, but also felt like it gave me this kind of license to take these works, works even further thematically, yeah. and kind of like commit on the level where if they're no, they were no longer about, uh, again, the, the, what we were talking about this, uh, you, individual thing, but more of this Jungian thing, this this collective uh, yeah. consciousness. They're not so they're not foreign anymore. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, we exactly. always used to see footage of like people in parliaments uh, at, far away who were beating the hell out of each other, and you thought, oh my god, what mad what madcap zaniness, you know? And now, you know, oh, it doesn't we seem all, so we're far we're removed. All foreigners now. Yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all this consequential chaos, I think, which is. 
you know, really disturbing and bewildering. And you've made really potent images, I think, out of that sort of fodder, less about the golden ratio, but just, just um, maybe talk a little bit. I'm showing some details about how you arrive at uh, this image. Um, and I'm showing you a detail here on the left. And then this is, this is Gagosian supplied setup, which is actually right behind you there. Yeah, that's right. So the, the M, there's again, there's three different ways uh, a painting mm -hmm. come to be. Uh, mm -hmm. One way is that a video already exists um, on YouTube in the public domain. You know, I, I searched, you know, I even got, I've gone to libraries and look, look, looking for things. Mm -hmm. so, or a painting exists in um, on an old. video cassette, right? This is yeah. home video, number 10, <laughs> Xenia's archive, right? Um, or, there, or there is an image. So those are the three things, meaning the image that, uh, whether it's a photograph or something that I take picture myself, but it's a still image. So those are, um, those are the three things that I can start to work with. In this case, of course, this was a still image. So uh, I, I can take the still image, I can, and take that digital image and record it onto a analog cassette and then begin to work with it. Mm -hmm. uh, or I already have an analog cassette that I begin to work with, or I transfer digital footage to analog and work with it. Either way, things that end up on VHS cassettes. And then mm -hmm. by, this is, this is where the logic sort of begins to fail because the machines are failing. And so the, there is no real like, oh, this is how I make this thing happen. It, it, I go from yeah. machine to machine and I can, you can sometimes it takes days to get to the point the machine does something and you like it. And the whole time I'm photographing the screen. So you see there's a camera here, you know, it's set up to, 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 to photograph that television and an archive of these distorted images is being built. And so then I will build a painting out of that. So, so it's really, I think that's a fascinating thing people should understand that the source images such as they are, are not pixelated. The source images are, are comfort. And then you're willfully sort of archaizing them, sort of taking them back to this earlier um, tech, earlier technology. I, well, I have created a language with video cassettes, right? This is how I work. Yeah. And so the means then begin to justify the ends. You start to come up with ways of, yeah. uh, of making that image happen that you want, that you, that you know you can get to. Um, and each yeah. time you, uh, the task becomes more and more nuanced because you're looking for more. Each, you know, the paintings become more uh, complicated. You're demanding more of them mm -hmm. because, and this is what I was really trying to work on with those figurative paintings that are that were kind of a detour was to constantly open up that space for the for the next painting to be more to to, to have a different kind of a mm -hmm. risk involved a a a space involved a, a tension in the surface involvement that pushed the work further because I felt like oh this is what happens when you get stuck. Right. So I knew that feeling and I didn't want that to be part of the work again. So the um with these works, yeah, like that they are a kind of product of fusing this desire for this language with the machines and then pushing all of that, pushing all of it until you get to a place that you you feel like, oh, that's a painting. I can see that as a painting. Yeah. And it also collapses history in a sense because you know it, it it renders it as universal as we've been talking about the universality of it across all these different sort of ways of seeing someone in the chat mentioned the idea of surveillance but these this idea of different electronic ways of seeing that are so caught up with our with our well, memory of actually, events you know this is another thing that like i think another childhood, I, I, I don't remember who said, I think it was like Tarkovsky in that book, Sculpting in Time. Yeah, it's about the almost, uh, almost universally, ideas are like born out of childhood experiences. 
for mm -hmm. artists it's it's such a such an important kind of way of formulating personal things uh, as, mm -hmm. as look back on sort of like this early childhood experiences as reasons or as kind of stimulus for for further exploration and so for me when i was 11 and i was in already in america so i left in 1990 it was still the soviet union the a year later in october the putsch oh no in august the putsch started and mm -hmm. the soviet union fell apart and it was on every television in america and um i watched tanks and you know firing at the white house and i watched the barricades being built and i watched the soldiers joining hands with the civilians and all of those things and then the yeltsin on the tank on the tv here in the mm -hmm. state and so i think for me it's the machines are one thing but it's also the the, the metaphysical nature of the screen itself is really important like yeah. you know, the, the the actual surface of the screen becomes this. Un, uh, somebody said this uh, the other day that it's an unreality, right. and I really like this idea that it's not reality. It is a com it, it is actually a fictional mnemonic experience that the TV gives me not an ability to kind of, to to go there, and mm. to, to to access something that isn't just oh, well, this is what happened, but it's how I remember it. And you start to then have the um, the strangeness of memory involved in an image. And I think that that's really important because memories always, wait, there was something actually Sally Mann said I saw recently, which I found amazing. She was saying um, that memories are, are perfect until you think of them. And as soon as you bring it up in your mind, so like, your mm. memory that you remember is perfect. And as soon as you actually think of it and try to remember it, it's gone. It's you've altered it and it'll never be the same again. And I see this yeah. as I, I see this as such a large part of my work of, of trying to decode memory in this way through this the, the videos. And in this sense, mm. it is very personal. Yeah. I think that's also it has to do with, you know, like you're talking about the screen as a as a conduit for experience and memory. And, you know, uh, we, we all have these phones and we get rid of them every two years. We don't ever feel nostalgic about our phones, but yeah. I guarantee you everybody out there can say, can remember their first TV, what yeah. they, how they used to watch TV, what that looked like. I remember the ones in my grandparents' house with how the screens were bubbled or different, right? Um, you know, we're much more attached to those kinds of things than the little devices that we carry. And I think that's a really potent element um, which you're bringing out in, in these pictures. Well, I think uh, also absolutely. maybe this kind of is anachronistic in a sense and why they, they work is because um, we see everything through the screen now. We hardly look at each other. You know? yeah. and, so, and, and so I think that there was something so novel at the time of my, when I was a kid of seeing your country kind of fall apart on the television. But I don't think it's novel now. I think, and I think that there's mm. gonna be a different mode of understanding what memory is down the yeah. road. Let's look at this painting and talk a little bit about that period in the early 1990s, the anti-penultimate end, 2019 large scale work with all these figures sort of seen from a bird's eye view looking down on a kind of glassy looking street, like it's been raining and then detritus sort of everywhere, broken elements here. And um, and uh, I read in an interview in the Kagosian magazine that uh, you had been thinking about this film, which is a documentary by Sergei Loznitsa. I don't know how to say it. Sergei Loznitsa, uh, the event, which came out in 2015. It's a little over an hour long. It's a documentary um, of footage that his team located that had been shot by the um, uh, Leningrad or St. Petersburg um, documentary <coughs> organization. It's like a government organization yeah, on well, film. Everything was a government organization. <laughs> right, there was on the, film, uh, black and white. Yeah. And they went through it and they overlay, uh, they used the, the, the only words are speeches or reports from uh, media uh, that they overlay with it. It's a little over an hour long and it's extraordinary about these couple of days in August 
uh, in uh, 1991, when the new government, the Glasnost uh, Perestroika government, um, almost collapsed, nearly collapsed in a, in a coup, um, it, and it, the, uh, the leaders of which were never brought to justice, except one of whom killed himself. But the, um, the, the order did collapse. That's the interesting thing. Did, this is what this film is. I find fascinating. I don't not to get into super mm. the weeds of the politics, but the film yeah. basically chronicles. The, the few days where this junta tried to take over and were not able mm -hmm. to because for various reasons, uh, the army didn't fully side with them. They were too extreme. And it now we know through history that KGB didn't side with them. They just thought that we're going yeah. to go our route. So this is very interesting. Just going to bide our time. Well, the, in, in St. Petersburg, the, the mayor of St. Petersburg was a guy named Subchuk. His deputy... Mm -hmm was a guy named um uh putin and Never heard of in the film <laughs> you see a <laughs> yeah. young putin in the film as a kind of like side character that walks out with subject yeah. of these meetings um yeah. so the film ends not on a and you this is this moment that you've pulled out this this moment where everybody in solidarity raises their fist i mean i choke up even looking at this watching this Every time I see this movie, and I've seen it several times, at this moment of this like intense hopefulness and solidarity, but the film ends mm -hmm. very, very morbidly. Yeah. Where they actually close up the archives. So the coup doesn't happen. Soviet Union falls apart. Right. You now have a kind of democratic order. People go to the archives and want to open the archives, and they cannot. And the archives are closed, and the kind of, and there's a kind of two streams of like, we are not Soviet Union anymore. We 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 have won our freedom, and yet our the the real history is being changed by the people behind the scenes. And so, yeah. and and Loznitz is very clear about this and how he ends this movie. And it's really um, and yeah. it's really uh sad and a kind of uh, prescient in in the way that what would happen in Russia and what can happen quite really anywhere. Um, but. I, my initial uh, kind of engagement with the film was also this idea that they found this footage, recontextualized it, made it into a work of art by adding by adding a score, and and so it's really similar to what I do in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. there, there, there's a, there's such a like clear for me overlap between that kind of work and the and the painting that I make, uh, and so that's why I, that's why I brought it up in that interview. So how does the title anti-penultimate um, reflect some of your thinking in this show? Anti-penultimate end, sorry. The title, ref the, and the word anti-penultimate refers to the one before the last, which mm -hmm. to me is a kind of like, it connotes an eternal return to something. So that's something that continues to end or have, or, 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 or you know, by end, maybe you could also see it as a rebirth, but, um, mm -hmm. The antepenultimate end is a kind is everybody thought it was the end of history when the Soviet Union fell apart. It was, uh, yeah. the, I believe, that was the term that was used by Fukushima or F Fukuyama, sorry, um, mm -hmm. to 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 understand that era, the end of history, and it now seems absolutely absurd. Right. You know, and and so I think that there's this really. Uh, human um, quality to see the moment you live in as unique, right. and 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 I think that um, when you start to zoom out, you see that it's just this eternal return to a kind of chaotic, um, selfish humanness. You know that that we and we continue to return to this to the state of chaos, and so that's what I was uh, referring to with that title. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we we hope it's unique. We hope that this moment is unique. I don't know. And we it move is. on from it. No, but in, in, you're saying, I mean, it never seems to be. It's yeah. It's part of an endless cycle. The, yeah. the the second to last to second to last, and on and right. on, and you never get to the last. Right. So painting like this is a kind of response, in a way, to that and this idea of milling crowds around. And we'll see that in um, Barricade, which we'll end with in a couple minutes. Um, people milling around, umbrellas, going about your everyday life, but with detritus covering the street and broken lampposts or other kinds of elements 
that are here. And then this, you know, this image of the the woman in red, she reminds me of the, the girl in Spielberg's, um, the Spielberg film. Um, but yeah, Schindler's List, that idea of a, in the midst of darkness. Uh, but then also you see the pixelation is there, which of course Khan laboriously paints every little stroke. This is all handmade. And then these extraordinary bolts of the, um, you know, the, the, I read this as sort of the governmental organizing factor, the lines in the street. If anyone's ever been to Moscow, you won't believe how wide the streets are, the lanes you can't cross without certain death. And my one most wonderful memories of that is that the lines of street sweepers who are just sort of yeah. staggered across the seven lanes of the main street coming in and cleaning the whole street. And well, you, you know, that's put like in a, these lines. It's the, it's the immediate mark of someone that's never been to Moscow is if when they tried to cross the street, because we use underpasses in Moscow. Right, right you have to. You, and have you to. can't cross the streets. It's a death right. sentence. Certain, even for a New Yorker who's used to just walking out into traffic. Especially for New Yorker. Yeah. yeah. And these sort of strips of the, almost bolts of like lightsabers going across, which are these, which are these, uh, the traffic lines trying to control a society that will not be controlled, right? That will never. Well, I, I was be also controlled. thinking with this painting, like this is the morning after the society completely comes apart. I mean, we don't fully understand here in America, and even I don't what that must have been like for people like there was nothing left of the order like there, there was no their jobs were meaningless their their pensions were meaningless their money that they had was meaningless everything was sort of became meaningless and yet these people the next day they got up they put their clothes on they got the umbrellas out they had a briefcase and they were going somewhere to work ostensibly right. and that was fascinating to me they weren't jumping out the windows like in no, New York no, in 1929. It's Let really it. interesting, yeah. yeah. You persevere. If you've been through Stalingrad and everything else, I guess you persevere. Two more works and then we'll, we'll turn over to questions. Just this one, which seems a little of an outlier, but I love it. Female figure after Popova. Um, and it's a large scale painting. Here's a figure for scale. Um, and uh, Popova is of course, one of the great uh, figures of the Russian avant-garde. Uh, female artists were very involved in the suprematist and constructivist movements around the time of the first revolution and uh, a moment when art was absolutely connected to politics in a way that almost never happens anymore. Um, here's an example of one of her Cubo futurist works in the kind of Malevichian um, Goncharova kind of mode. Uh, and uh, here is the work that Khan has sort of been looking at, which wonderfully is, a, a, is attributed to Popova. Um, so sort of one step removed already, but is a wonderful piece of design nonetheless, right? Whoever did it. And then using his technique, which we've learned about transferring it and turning it into something which is equally riveting, but also riven by these lines that are crossing and distorting it. Um, is this a, something that you've been doing now, working with works of art that this we're not first, privy to? We've all, this, this is, is the first, first one, okay. Time, this is the first time I did it. I found this group of paintings that are um, unattributable, that came out, mm. that sort of reappeared after the 90s. Uh, what happened was uh, after a period of um, post-revolutionary kind of zeal and optimism, once Lenin died and, and Stalin came to power, the a lot of the Cubo futurists and, and and suprematists and all of the kind of Russian avant-gardists were they they were either um, prevented from working further or were made to make social realist art. Like the standards changed overnight, and this was now undesirable kind of bourgeois art, and. Um, you know, Popova, of course, comes from a wealthy family. She was quite a revolutionary, but, you know, they were very bohemian people. And, and I think that that, uh, and this kind of searching, searching hopefulness was not Stalin style anyway. And so they were, um, they were, she 
didn't witness any of the stuff. I think I believe she died from scarlet fever and at age 35. But mm -hmm. you know, Rodchenko and Malevich and all of them basically were either sent away or they had to do state-sponsored stuff. They were never able to make work again that they yeah. were that they're known for. And and a lot of the paintings that they made, if they weren't snuck out by Westerners at the time during or after the revolution, were put were were called something zero category. Um, I believe that that's the name that they were given as a, as a kind of uh, a state bureaucratic title. And they were hidden away and in, 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 uh, stripped of their provenance. And they began to reappear again in the 90s after the, the coup, the failed coup and the Soviet Union fell apart, which of course connects this immediately to the work that the, the other paintings, this kind of reappearance of this this uh these images is similar to the kind of fight in the parliament and the um and the moscow images in that sense that that this painting is like kind of reborn out mm -hmm. of this uh tempest right yeah. um but what i found the most interesting thing about them was that no one really knows whether they're a lot of them were may have been faked to, in order to sell to in, in the Western market as uh, as Russian constructivist work that are quite valuable. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are not fake, but aren't able to be uh, uh, um, certified or, or nobody knows because their provenance and all of the things that made them real were stripped. Names, canvases were cut out and signatures were cut off. And, you know, they, mm -hmm. they lay like nearly rotted in some basement in some regional museum, you know. Um, and so this, the, I found a collection of these paintings and I began really fascinated with them because I sort of started seeing not the image itself, but um, the kind of ethos of it, the, the, the life span of it is similar to my own, like a, a kind of orphaned uh, uh, painting or an orphaned person mm. without, the, without, or the, because the place where I grew up no longer really exists. And so um, that was that's my connection to making this painting. But it's also mm -hmm. I find it fascinating that these paintings were unattributable, meaning that they they if I am repainting it, I am kind of reattributing it. You know. Yeah, yeah, and it's all part of your kind of elaborate self portraiture. I, yeah, but about. this is this is probably true, and in that sense, yeah, I see them. I see like I identify with this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's just finish up and then we'll turn to the Q&A, just some details for people to see the technique. And again, I encourage you to go to 75th and Park and commune with them in the flesh. They're quite remarkable. And then finally, Barricade uh, from 2021, another image of a sort of street scene seen from slightly above uh, with people milling around, but it's been um, distorted on another level with these sort of blocks of monochromatic gray here, which read as like stones, but instead of sort of glitches in the um, glitches in the tape, well, which I totally remember from VHS tapes, and you would just get these areas of solid color that didn't read as anything um, amongst the rest of the detritus and some extraordinary details like these figures who are gathered around this big element, whatever that is, we'll never know. I haven't seen the source image, but immediately um, these people sort of gather around and you know the, the ones in the back are less resolved than the ones in the foreground. So there's a little bit of that kind of perspective, but it made me think immediately of the dance by Matisse, which is of course famous avant-garde picture of French, which is in uh, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg from the Shukin uh, collection. Um, part of the, a couple of great collectors of Matisse while he was alive in the early 20th century. I think that's yet another subconscious thing that's going on there, I would guess. Um, <laughs> and this big mound of earth there in the middle and between them. But then this lone figure who I saw like on the left, sort of standing and looking at the scene, almost like hands in his pocket and meditative, almost like a Rukin figure in a German romantic painting, who's staring not at something wondrous in nature, but at something, you know, somewhat inexplicable what the hell is going on here he is right here in this scene that you're seeing here so i'll leave it from my end at that you can, can comment we, on oh, this 
Can we throw yeah. back the Matisse side by side? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And then we'll move. I, to um, this. it's interesting that you you made that connection because I wouldn't have made that connection, but I looked at a lot of Matisse in in that period of making the figurative paintings that I was making because huh. I was really trying to figure out a way of dealing with space um, in, within the paintings, like how to push space around with color and how to make it feel like the movement of space and the kind of spatial uh, demands meet at the edges. Like mm. and this is what Matisse was so beautiful at, like, yeah. It wasn't that the, 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 um, the play, like, that the figures are simplified, is that the way they, the edges of the figures deal with the colors around them, give them volume. And so that right. he's able to do that because of the way he, the, the, the spatial kind of tension in the paintings work. It's not, it's, 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 a, it's not that he's simplifying things, he's making the color do the work for him. And mm -hmm. I, and so I um I was really looked at that a lot, and so that comes out a lot in these paintings, and in in these areas specifically where you have this kind of void gray color, um in um in in barricade, it this was actually the most difficult. Yeah, this is a good one. The the one before. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is a good one. Where this was really the most difficult part of all of the paintings that I did was to, was trying to figure out the right value and the right kind mm. of flatness and the right uh, way of making these two things work, the figures and these spaces. Now, the way I see them is, again, that same way that Matisse um, would put that a kind of flat, washy background and then have a figure mm. on top of it and have a and have the two, those two things kind of collide and give each other that sort of ele electrify each other. I, I, I thought of that a lot as I was making these flat areas because to me, that's how they, they're, they function at, at best is that the edges electrify each other. There has to be that kind of yeah. like strange tension right at the edge. And until that's there, right. and that, that, that happens, I think by building up and constantly working that space, that area. Um, uh, so it took, it took quite a long time to get, but this was the hardest painting actually of all five of the five paintings that I did. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's, what's interesting is that's, that is the most resolved part of the picture, these flattened areas of gray, right. as opposed to the rest of it. It, it ends up being the most resolved part and yet it's the most curious and ephemeral in a way and and, and it's and, interesting and like it's, that how much personality the figures do end up kind of carrying through right uh because right. again this goes back to like that simple like with the looking at the matisse like the, for instance the one at mom of the boy at um at the piano like mm -hmm. the music lesson the music lesson yeah it, the boy is so simplified, but you really fully, I'm like, I know that boy. I understand who that boy yeah. is. You, when you start thinking about what other painters do faced with these kind of issues, like how do you, how do you convey a personality of a figure that's very little, you, mm -hmm. that concern becomes kind of like the concern, <laughs> you know, of the painting. Like once yeah. you get into it, like there's no other, everything else kind of becomes secondary. Plus, you have this familiarity telescope through time via the technique, which I think becomes very eloquent. Right. And you know, whenever you have figures in it, it, those are the things that are that you're attracted to. In addition to these sort of Kubrickian monoliths um, that you see here, these strange sort of objects, which were not really objects. All right, Con, I'm going to step aside now and turn right it on. over to Cal so thank, he can thank, field thank some questions. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you, and thank you for all your interpretations. That was really sweet. Thank you, Jason. Of course, it's great. I begin of a longer, more and more conversation. So I really appreciate you coming on with us today. And Wonderful. congratulations on the show. People go see it. Thank Let's you, Brooklyn Rail, show. everyone. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jason. So um, we're going to transition over to the Q&A section now. We have one question from our friend contributor, Andrew Woolbright. I uh, am going to prompt you to unmute yourself. Andrew mentioned that he might have to run, so I might have to ask it on his behalf, but 
Are you there, Andrew? Okay, Andrew asked, I'm thinking about apophenia, which is seeing pattern and information where there isn't any and its relationship to pattern recognition or sense making. I'm also thinking about Sigmar Polka, particularly his paintings that use drone videos from a mission and how the closer you zoom in, the less you know, the more you approach abstraction. How do you feel about what gets lost in translation in these works? Is there anything you feel that gets lost between the image and the hand that drives the work? What gets lost in painterly encryption? I think whatever gets lost is also get is gained. I mean, like I, I know this is not. I don't want to be make a cop out, but I think the less information and what we were just talking about with the figures, the more the the figure becomes generalized, the more I as a painter can put my own kind of um, personality into it. And so like the guy, like the way he slopes and the way, because we don't see the features so well, and because everything is so becomes so kind of uh, generalized in, 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 the, in the video, because, you know, it's just pixels. I can then, I think, open that up into my own, for my own kind of interpretation and give it, and give it some, uh, something that wasn't in the original image. In terms of pattern and polka, uh, polka is a big influence, especially with like, you know, the moray pattern and stuff. So sometimes when you photograph my paintings, like just on the phone, they have a, a moray pattern on them just because they are like, because the, the phone thinks you're photographing a, a TV screen um, and they get, you get those weird moray waves. I, I, I mean, I don't know the, a lot of that stuff. If I'll just say this, I'm not the kind of person who set out to paint every pixel on the TV screen? <laughs> you know, like um, that wasn't, that's not in my personality. It was something that developed over time. And it was at the service of kind of getting to a, an image that felt like a memory, felt like, like um, something familiar and at the same time wasn't uh, photographic, wasn't like, just a reference to something. One, I wanted to go like dig a little bit deeper into my own psyche or how I feel about or how I remember things. And so the pattern is kind of in the surface of that. But for me, uh, I, um, to me, the polka in paintings that I like the most are the ones that are like, you know, more about like that psychedelic strangeness of his mind, like the, the, the ones on the silk, for instance. Um, uh, with the with the large um, uh, color fields that I really thought those are my favorite ones. Thank you, Khan. Um, we will now go over to our friend, the aforementioned Mr. Schwartz. I'm asking you to unmute yourself. Thank you, thank you, Cal, and of course Jason and and Khan. Uh, this 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 work really jumps, man. It's great. Thank um, you. A question is, uh, you, you've said um, here, and I think in a quote somewhere, that uh, there's an eternal return to chaos that we humans play out, no matter you know, how secure and comfy and safe we feel. Uh, do you believe, because of your connection with, with sort of this biography and with the self-portraiture and everything that's going on, do you believe, uh, as an artist, we have the... Um, the chaos within us, we have to channel that chaos with us in order to, to uh, help give birth to creation? I do. I think that that's accurate. I, I also think that um, as artists, we are a kind of the greatest channelers of that impulse. I mean, we should, you know, people think that uh, societies are able to govern themselves by taming that impulse, but I don't know if that's the case. I think it is when there is a kind of window or a mirror that's put up in front of us that we begin to recognize our impulses. And so artists do that, you know? And so I, I do see that as, um, as something that we provide as, as, as members of this society. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, GE, for your question. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to transition over to hand the stage to our poet at the rail. We have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the afternoon, Imogen Christian Smith, to the stage. 
Poet and performer Imogen Christian Smith has had work appear in Apogee, Nat Brut, Peach Mag, and Togverk, among others, as well as in We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics. Their debut collection, Stemmy Things, is from Nightboat, out in fall 2022. Imogen works and lives and works on the Lenape lands in Brooklyn. Imogen, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. It was really great to um, be a witness to this conversation. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm going to read kind of a long prose poem that hopefully I have, hopefully fits my time constraints. It was written uh, largely in January of 2020 um, with some later revisions. It's called Year of the Rat. Time is of the essence, essentially banal. Matter gains mass, hues as presence, what moments devour, forms reforming poly and ecologic from the get. Phases flitter queerly, evanescent and light. Tragedy, however minor, slips the mouth of morning, day upon day upon day, everything turning other, tangling velocity, your city, your block, 4.30 p.m. and winter sundown come night's descending jets. I hope you get where you're going, that the state fails, but people don't. I hope I get fucked today and that men on stoops, on sidewalks, up grocery aisles, park benches, in passenger seats and behind desks all cease their leering. Let a girl walk home in peace. It's like we've mined all hope from earth gut. We children, hewn of similar stuff. Often it seems like too much has been extracted. When I feel this way, I wake, having not the right. Time and being shift stormy batter fences, say nation states, race and fixed genders, the unreal so utterly consuming. The year chimes for the year chimes with a fury others will match. January, slash and burn raging, the topsoil a foundate for smolder. The world's all sender and I get lit too, become one of those concerned citizens you see reading Hana Arendt on the train. No shame, but it is a specific mood, a demographic kind of thing. Speaks to class, privilege, white, as in we've hardly seen the beginning of demagoguery, didn't you know? Performative rage notwithstanding. I'm unpacking my memory palace, cavorting with bacteria smeared ancient through gut, the pipes of my body, my city. Here you are, arrived. It matters little what you wanted. History, says Hannah. Fuck me, says Imogen. What's on the tip of your tongue, baby? Smacking my fucking gay head. Several days since New Year's and I'm blanking, moving content about the poem, seeing so many pictures of disfigured koalas in Australia, stolen place, of kangaroos holding one another like children abandoned to nights of war, hoping for water and shelter, hostilities to cease. Do marsupials have a name for the root of all burn and is it man? Is it, oh, pioneers, is it scorched earth, dry and withering? Comes a time, comes a time when, comes a time, you and I and we and we enter time as bodies on arrival's gate. 2020, barely January, did the president just start World War III? At the time of my writing, it's trending on Twitter. World War III is trending on Twitter. Hashtag World War III, Battlefield Iran and America's self-righteous bloodlust. I wish I were fictioning that this was the product of some dystopian prompt, but it's not. To paraphrase Hannah, the world's a fire and has been forever, yet I'm optimistic despite or against history and better judgment, nature included. After all, there's lineage, Rosa and Hannah, Audrey and June, Leslie, Jimmy, Muriel, and Mahmoud, their syntax in motion weaving alongside us, the language resonant, intact. A person should listen to the dead, you know. Die Toten Mannheim uns, they remind us. It's like queer utopia, this decade or we're done. Like no more disaster capital, band-aid neoliberal or we're done. It's like no more white supremacy, white history, white property or we're done. No borders, colonies, illegal settlements or we're done. It's like fuck cops and armies and walls, fuck prisons and dilapidated subways, ableist architectures wobbling high over for graves of workers and the enslaved or we're done. No more Clintons or Johnsons or Trumps, no more Netanyahu's or Blair's 
dwarves, etc. No handsome young premiers or sweet talkers to save us, poets included. Like, take a good look in the mirror, everyone, or we're done. It's like civilizational clash, east and west, is myth propagated by popes and clerics by politicos, mostly men, over time is false or we're done. It's like people power or we're done. Like people come together knowing we've shit to settle and redistribute, but first, or we're done, like realization of non-human autonomy or nope, canceled. It's like consensually fuck your gender, fuck your friends, masturbate with vigor or we're done. It's 10 million things I could never name because of body, time, class, place, situation, right? Get it? Whatever we do, we might be done. But all my sweeties from Noikon to Ridgewood are hot for mutual aid, dilating ring after ring and brimming electric. So even if we are, we must act as though we aren't done. Today I took a cab with driver K, one borough of Berlin across another to another, Neukölln to Prenzlauerberg and several decades in time. 17 years in Berlin, K said, and Moscow before that. He told me folks in Moscow were kind, but the Germans not so. Not even Berliners, I ask, not even Berliners. Okay, this isn't my experience, but remember, you're stuck in your skin. And the year of the ox, K hopes to travel to New York with sun. Come, I say, the government is fucked, cards hard to get, borders shuttered because racists, because fascists, because Islamophobes and white supremacists, but you know all this. Please come. I will welcome you, welcome you, and many more. Me, an American citizen traveling by cab through the Old West, Old East Berlin, through generations of ideas and temporality and rubble, traveling in a car driven by K, an Iraqi. It's 2020, we cannot be done. There is so much work to do. In my heart, I kept asking, keep asking myself, Imogen, how will you show up for this moment, this extremely human moment right now, this? now collecting in my mind's eye i see baghdad and basra fallujah and mosul rocket flares on cnn the president landing on warship like mission accomplished k drops me in prenzlauerberg drive safe i say have a good day Every day this January, I wake in Berlin, throw open red drapes and say good morning to the yard, stare out kitchen window towards weeping willow, eat muesli and roughage and toast speared Nutella, the gray winter sky sobbing slightly. Steffi plays Bowie other side of the wall and outside cyclists ding their bells, cars passing cranes along Panyestrasta where I'm gentrifier, white US girl even in Neukon, a fact my trans changes nowhere, even as I feel so mild safe, so utterly home. From where again have I come? It's not a new feeling. Do you get that? Who and what survives a colony, a diaspora, a so-called global community? Who and what survives the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st centuries? Birds? Bees? What must we become in order to? Say it again on the tip of your tongue? Thinking across distance, the greens and towns, the Rhineland, oversee to New York City, south toward Piedmont and Appalachia of my youth. I say gravely to no one, fuck that place, it fucking sucks. America, stolen place, violence, synonyms. Sometimes one courts such thoughts and feeling self-satisfied, pats their shoulder smug with privilege, all like, that's not me, only it is, it is. And as Césaire has taught us, Europe is unforgivable. Every day I wake, I wanna be a flapper girl, wanna get fucked tonight by one, maybe two people of indeterminate gender, wanna dazzle myself with myself, lick rim, come in my own face, crying hard for more, split me open, BB, hex me out hard and make me quiver, make me beg and suffer. First night in Germany, A slept beside me, borrowed my Slater Kenny tea, played Big Spoon, alarm set, we slept till noon, ventured out and tried on clothes, made us look all Marlene Dietrich and Merino wool, ate two euro donor, everything covered in graffiti, rise Rojave, rose a wheat pace, Antifa and extinction rebellion, radical sloganeering, so dreamy, I'm here for it, a real sucker for socialist imaginary. My phone alert says the president will explode antiquities, says N can't get a visa, but we have always welcomed Nazis. I steal myself for minor humiliation 
emotions factored in as part my day, though it's only a child looks at A and I like we're fairies, smiling over their shoulder. I see you, I see you, hello. Malice lurks, but isn't the whole. I look at my phone and there's fire. Look and see another man gets time served. Look up at shop windows, free Palestine scrawled in bold. Look back down and here's a cute date. A missed call from B as I trip over Stolperstein and platforms and dress. Read names, dodge the tram, smell every bakery, take coffee, shop Lidl, still jet lagged and sauntering home. Who was the first to feel fear, to practice cruelty and why? Is it a particle gaining mass? It's banal, every last inch of it, the tidiness of cobblestone, the once route of walls. I love being alive. Is this crass of me? Green-headed mallards and swans, boxy bodies afloat on canal, bathe beneath bridges on Kotbus or Dom. Koalas front page the Guardian wearing third degree burns. Mustachioed men sip thick Turkish roast, smoke cigarettes, speak endlessly. Queers with pink hair and big raver shoes holding hands and I'm hot for them. Wanna fuck them, wanna be them. S brings me kombucha she made at Kotori. Audrey Lord, the Berlin years screening at Kino, sold out but they squeezed me in. Grown men, madly men, manly men, all like chowy, chusy, it makes me giggle, genau. Day's old banquet near rotting in the basement of another country where I think finger through pages of water stayed Benjamins, trans women in the next room dragging JK Rowling like what a turf. Assalamu alaikum across the weeks. I try each bake of baklava at Conditori Al Jazeera, pistachio and cashews and nothing's ever tasted so sweet. Silver future for my 38th rotation, mocktails, bedazzled curtains, my friends, black and brown, Chinese and Bahamian, indigenous American and me, white gender fuck in Neukölln, Berlin, thinking back to New York City, something of a Weimar doom about the place. It's like queer utopia this decade or we're done. Like be radically soft and fiercely rad in the streets, in the bed, in the class, wherever you study. Cruising park lanes and soul trains, the red carpet welcomes of one's chosen fam. It's like know your enemies, cops and bureaucracies spelling out policies held high in courts at gunpoint at cellular threat or we're done. Capiche? Done. It's like save your seeds and share everything. Repatriate land if you have it. Tend a smaller plot we're done. It's like anticipate PPE for the good of others, like shift your pronouns or the, on the daily or don't, like cross not the picket line, but yes, use you as barricade for bodies in history's way. I mean, try to feel something about what isn't you, aka difference, the commons, the many, or we're done through like either or is either over or we're finished and we can't be finished babies not while there's good techno to dance to in sweaty rooms good drugs to take and water to quench us friends to make and keep and process alongside to fuck and be fucked by while surviving through to another coffee morn looks to turn chances to take years of trauma to shake through the sieve on my birthday, I visit the Garden of the Socialists and lie alone on Rosa's rosy bed, asking her how she kept getting over, over and over and over, fighting day upon day upon day, just to end up snatched off the street, bullet to head and tossed to river like so many women, like so many bereft of mass. And you know what she said? She said, baby, I am just one and you are just one. And there are multitudes, our ancestors, our lineages and all those to come. Baby, and this is what Rosa said, baby, there is so much work to do, so much work. We cannot be done. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Imogen. And thank you, Khan, and thank you, Jason, and thank you to everyone who tuned in today uh, for your incredible questions and ponderings in the chat. As always, we will share the recording of today's program in our YouTube archives, so it will be available in a day or two if you'd like to revisit this conversation. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Dawood Bey and Rail Consulting Editor Joaquin Pizarro. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Bernardo Wade. You can turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave on your way out right now. Chaos lives in poets, too. Great job, Imogen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. It wasn't a poem, it was a manifesto. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for Thank coming. You. It was great. Thank you, Khan. Thank you, Imogen. Thanks for spending your afternoon uh, with us.
And um, we'll see you again. Thank you, Cal. And, Thank uh, you, everyone.